Cool? All right. Um, one second. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, for coming. So, you know, we're in a college town. Decided to do a bit of a tribute to my college experience, and we're going to do a bit of like a fire hose survey. We're going to go really, really fast through a bunch of different ways to look at Ethereum. I'm not going to be able to spend as much time as I'd like to on most of these topics, but hopefully give you some interesting food for thought, and would love to talk more about each of these things later. So first, some quick, not super important, but just brief intro of myself. Studied math and CS, uh, pretty close to here at MIT back in the day. I live in San Francisco. I had a fun experience real early at a company called Dropbox. Learned a lot there. Did some other stuff afterward, and been helping the Ethereum Foundation for the past couple of years. So, like I said, with today's talk, we're going to go through a bunch of different perspectives. Um, but before even diving into the specific perspectives, like why is this important? I think one of the reasons it's important is when you have a complex topic, it's valuable to take different perspectives to try to better understand it. And if you think it's like, oh no, it's not going to be that hard to understand this, well, I decided to dig up some fun quotes from you know, about 20 some years ago. Uh, first we have, ironically, the in inventor of Ethernet. It has nothing to do with Ethereum, but it did have a lot to do with the internet. So it's kind of an interesting to see a quote from the inventor of Ethernet about the internet. Um, here's something about, yeah, you know, retraining 250 million people. Who's ever going to do that for the internet? Um, this one's a bit longer, but it's basically like, my local mall is doing more business than like the entire internet, like blah, blah, blah. And I almost felt bad including this. He's gotten a lot of crap for this, but you know, Paul Krugman's infamous uh, quote. Um, I do want to be clear. I'm not trying to compare blockchain or Ethereum to the internet. Like, that alone would be the exact opposite of, I think, what like, we should be doing. Uh, actually, what I'm trying to get at is, you know, a lot of you have probably heard of the parable of the blind men and the elephant. Right? And the idea is like, you know, these different blind men touch different parts of an elephant. They all, get, they all have incomplete and incorrect views on what they're touching. Uh, and, and if you think about like, trying to predict the future or see where things are going, it's kind of analogous to this. So that's why I decided to try to take this like, multi-perspective angle. And the first one is just history. Uh, as saying often goes, history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. And started with a quote from just a couple of weeks, or maybe it's like two months ago now, uh, from Bology on Twitter. Uh, but yeah, I think looking at the past is often just as fascinating as trying to think about what the future can be. And so one thing I thought about recently was imagine being there for and typing on a keyboard and like seeing like letters appear on the screen like for the first time like obviously this is natural to us today but imagine being there for like the, that first moment well when I thought about it I was like actually probably a lot of people didn't care probably a lot of people were like eh, we can already do this with a typewriter you know what's the big deal and if you think through like even just moving data around right like many people in this room are probably too young to have used many if any of the the first few things here. But there's been quite an evolution through the years for the way people move things around. Uh, I remember, you know, my family was not well off. The one thing that we would invest very heavily in was technology. And my parents talk about how when I was two, they spent $600 to buy a 20 megabyte hard drive for the first uh, computer that I had as a kid. So I was really fortunate that they cared enough to, to do that. But you just think about that for a moment. I mean, it's still better than storing stuff on Ethereum right now, but it's a, it's a lot of money for not very much stuff. Um, another thing that's I think is interesting when you look, take a historical perspective is you have this like imitation thing that goes on. And, and as I say, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And it gets even more interesting when the imitation doesn't make any sense. Uh, so one of my favorite throwback examples is how JavaScript was originally named Mocha. Uh, and it was renamed to JavaScript because Java, totally separate language, works very differently, uh, was extremely popular at the time. They're like, all right, yeah, we're just going to name it JavaScript. And now it's the most used programming language in the world. Um, so kind of like an interesting parallel here. You have Solidity, which is, many of you may know. It's used to write, it's one of the ways you can write contracts on Ethereum. It's used to interface with the Ethereum virtual machine. Syntax was like, motivated a lot by JavaScript because of JavaScript's popularity, even though I think coding in Solidity is probably better thought of as like, writing you know, bash scripts. It, you probably don't want to take a front-end developer kind of mindset when building stuff on Ethereum. Not that that stops a lot of people, but hey, that's, that's where we're at. Uh, and just like, as a fun fact, even like, the creator of JavaScript works on the Brave browser. It's actually a great browser. If you haven't tried it, you don't need a blockchain to be using the browser. Um, but it was funded by a token issued uh, on Ethereum. So like I said, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. 
Along those lines, there's this like performance optimization rhyme throughout history. And I'm just gonna go a little bit more quickly here, but in 2005, when I started MIT, I remember there was this kind of like contrarian narrative that performance optimization wasn't going to matter anymore. It kind of made sense at the time. Like computers just kept getting faster and faster, and it's like, yeah, you could performance optimize, but you could also make things more readable or more accessible in other ways. Are you even going to need to like optimize things that much in another 10 years? Of course, then the smartphone revolution uh, came along, and all of a sudden everyone had this like slow computer with even slower internet, and performance optimization started to matter again. And now we've got you know blockchain computing, which is like basically going all the way back to the beginning. It's pretty much punch card computing or mainframe computing. Um, so now the second perspective I'm going to take is is an engineer's perspective, right? And one thing that I've found really fascinating over the last 15 years is how much software engineering has changed. Uh, I remember talking to somebody about building stuff on Ethereum. A really bright kid, uh, a wonderful person, but was like, yeah, how could you possibly write code and then like, you know, put it on this blockchain and you're not gonna be able to change it afterward? That just seems impossible. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess you probably have never used a CD-ROM, right? Like, how do you think when people issued software on CD-ROMs, like, how are they gonna update it back, back then? Um, and it's because like, the software engineering companies today have become much more safe environments, which is great. It's made software engineering a lot more accessible. Uh, on the other hand, blockchain engineering, it's kind of like going from the city to the jungle. It, it's an unsafe, coding environment. And one of the reasons for this is because computing on blockchain is, you're sort of imposing some laws of physical reality onto the virtual world. It's like why you can have scarcity, for instance. And so I, I often note that I'm not sure thinking about writing software on Ethereum is like, should be thought of as software engineering. Uh, it's kind of more like building hardware than software. And, and along those lines, you know, I am confident, I am optimistic about the future of blockchain-based systems. Uh, because, you know, we can build cars, we can build bridges, skyscrapers, space shuttles. And I think we can build systems that are complex yet reliable on blockchain as well. But we're going to have to, you know, use very different best practices than the ones that we're using today. The third perspective is the research perspective. So blockchains are often considered inefficient, but they're actually very efficient at what they fundamentally do. They allow, like, a lot of distinct, just, like, nodes or uh, entities to come to probabilistic consensus about something. You don't need to know everyone else in the network. You don't need to be connected to everyone. You know, when I was taking distributed algorithms at, at MIT, you were like working with 50 nodes and you were assuming they were all on the same network and all this other stuff. And now we, you can have you know, 10,000 and more nodes coming to consensus with, with very high probability using like, a lot of the principles that power blockchains. It's just that when you try to then do more stuff on top of this, there's these other factors that make them a lot less efficient. Um, and what, another thing that I think is interesting is from a research perspective, well, cryptography, as many of you know, it uses computational hardness as its fundamental building block. Like the fact that it's hard to do certain things is actually good because that's what allows us to, to have cryptography and build things on top of it. And crypto economics, which is like kind of what blockchains bring into the equation, they bring in this like economic component, which essentially gives you more like knobs and dials to work with. It uses this like economic or incentive-based or game theoretical hardness as like its fundamental building block in addition to using cryptography and, and other things like that. And so just overall, I, I found it fascinating that in an Ethereum or blockchain context, I've run into some of the things that I really never thought I'd see again after college, after I decided I wasn't gonna, you know, I don't know, be like a math PhD or whatever. Um, <laughs> quick examples would be like Fermat's little theorem or just like any abstract algebra, never thought I'd see any of that again. Um, zero knowledge proofs. I would bring them up as party at parties because I thought it made me sound cool, but actually probably had the opposite effect. It's like, hey, you know, you can like there's this thing called a zero knowledge proof, and if I like, you know, put this like ball behind my back and do this stuff, and people are like, what? What are you talking about? Uh, and then even just uh, Professor Ron Rivest, who I saw last May at this uh, VDF Day event that I can talk more about uh, if you grab me later on. So it's been cool that you know blockchain Ethereum has brought some of these things back into my life, and overall. Ethereum and other blockchain systems have just done a lot to stimulate cryptography and zero knowledge proof research and development, as well as just uh, distributed systems and, and consensus and, and stuff like that. Um, and so moving along, we've got the computing stack perspective, right? When I think about the most interesting technical environments I've been in, uh, the a seminal like, experience for me was when I was 12, uh, I built a computer. Well, I mean, I didn't really build it. I just bought a bunch of parts. It was an excuse as a school project to get my parents to pay for you know, all this stuff. But I bought a bunch of parts, I plugged them together, you know, you had to like make sure everything fit, you know, like a tower and all that. And it always left me with this memory, like, 
Yeah, a computer's a thing you can take apart. A computer's a thing that has pieces, and each of those pieces themselves can then be taken apart. And that always stuck with me. Um, and, you know, even when I worked at Dropbox, what I thought was interesting was I never really had to go that deep into the stack. And Dropbox is already a fairly complex like software engineering system by modern standards. Like, it is a desktop app, which very few products have nowadays. It had extremely high correctness requirements. And even then, we were really barely moving outside of this like, fairly narrow slice of the computing stack. Now, when I look at blockchain-based computing, it's really cool to see this opportunity and need to reinvent the entire computing stack. I mean, it's one thing to be like, I'm going to write a programming language, and like, <coughs> no one's going to use your new programming language nowadays unless it comes with a new context in which it might be like especially useful. And so, just like smartphones were a new context, and a lot of new programming languages and paradigms emerge out of that, you might see something like that uh, in, in blockchain. And similarly, the entire developer experience. You know, I mentioned cars and bridges and skyscrapers. You know, I like to tell people I would not want to drive across a bridge that was built in JavaScript. And so, like, it, we're probably going to have to do a lot more work on that front as well. And overall, I just think this is the first time in literally decades that so many parts of the computing stack are simultaneously accessible uh, to be worked on in a practical context. Uh, I, I've like, thought a lot about, hey, what would it have been like to be part of the early days of the internet or operating systems or even just computer, computers themselves? And I feel really fortunate because in some ways it's like being present for all of those at the same time just in this new context. So moving in a different direction for a moment, this like legal or game theoretical perspective, <laughs> one thing that the like, blockchain uh, and work just being in a blockchain environment has really helped me understand better is, so like, what is the purpose, for instance, of the legal system? I, I used to think like, oh, you know, the legal system exists to enforce laws, but, but now I realize it actually exists in part to create society-wide confidence that laws will be enforced. Um, and having the society-wide confidence shifts the equilibrium of how people behave at scale. This is what's interesting. When you have a big group of people that think differently about something, it then has these other macro effects on how they're likely to act. And so one of the things I think is still underrated about blockchains is, I'm not sure this is totally possible yet, but we're moving in a direction where you can have these anonymous, credible commitments for meaningful things. It would have been an oxymoron even 10 years ago. You would have achieved it by using some sort of mutually trusted third party. Um, but Overall, we're seeing this like, new primitive, um, and when you have new primitives, it creates new equilibria for new behavior. What kind of behavior? Like, you know, it's still really, really early, but it's an exciting prospect. A lot of you are probably aware of the prisoner's dilemma. If you don't know what it is, I don't have time for, uh, to go into it here, but I definitely recommend uh, Googling and just reading about it. It's one of the most fascinating things. Um, and one thing that I always try to remind people is the prisoner's dilemma actually is solvable. It's just not directly solvable. In particular, you either have to change the payout matrix, which involves some sort of communication or maybe even deeper commitment, or you have to turn the prisoner's dilemma into an iterated game, in which case it becomes a lot more favorable, even if the one-shot game is unfavorable. And so, again, by having this like, new type of language that can be built around guarantees instead of promises, I don't know if this is actually going to come through, but, but I've heard people talk about this don't be evil versus can't be evil thing, and hopefully we'll be able to see innovations that, that can lead to that. So the, the last uh, major perspective is that of talent. This is a pretty bold statement, but I really think the amount of technical talent in blockchain is going to go up a lot. And the reason for this is because of a few concepts. First, te top technical talent always wants to work with other top technical talent. I mean, this one I think is a pretty easy one to understand. But another thing to keep in mind is that top technical talent rarely looks for new opportunities. They're happy where they are. They're usually like, you know, working on interesting stuff and, and well appreciated where they are and things like that. And so if you really want to understand what might be coming along, you don't want to ask people what they're doing or look at what they're doing. You want to say, like, if you were looking for a change, which I know you're not, like, what would you consider? And so counterintuitively, top talent is actually a lagging indicator, not a leading indicator. It's something that's really important to keep in mind. And with that, when you see one respected peer become interested in a topic, that's worth more than a thousand days of like hype and, and news cycle. So, you know, I think back to when I joined Dropbox back in 2008, it's like pretty motley crew, right? And people were like, well, it's a startup thing, that's weird, you should be going to grad school, you should be going to finance, you should go work at Microsoft, whatever. 
And not too many years later, you know, founders like on the cover of Forbes and people are like, oh, this startup thing is actually kind of interesting. And you know, by 2016, it's like, it's almost weird if you're not interested uh, in startups. So came along pretty quickly. Uh, so since I think the blockchain-based computing is just the most interesting environment that not just software engineers, but you know, economists, cryptographers, lawyers, <laughs> probably even multi-level marketers uh, have encountered in a long time, it's, it's just a gravity well for different types of people. And when more of these people come together, like who knows what's going to come out of it. So, so my closing thoughts, like I said, who knows what's going to come out of it, right? It's not that clear that Ethereum is only going to be a part of like solutions problems. I think it's quite possible it's also going to cause a lot of problems, whether it's Ethereum or other just like programmable blockchain systems. And so that's something that we just like constantly have to keep in mind. Again, trying to look into the future, it's this blind men and the elephant thing all over again. I, it's important, I think, for all of us to, to stay humble and just continue to think about what it is that we're missing, what is it that we're not seeing as we like kind of move into this new frontier. So as my final quick perspective, Remember what I said about how like a lot of people don't care, probably didn't care the first time. Like it's like so what? There's this computer terminal thing, but what do you even do with this computer thing? Like who even cares about that? And I think that that's something important also for everyone here to keep in mind, which is almost everyone who's interested in Ethereum or blockchain stuff today, they've crossed essentially this intellectual chasm. But the mainstream doesn't care. Like for the mainstream to actually, you know, interface with blockchains, we're gonna have to cross a usefulness chasm. And so in this sense, like blockchain is very different than like Facebook or the internet or whatever, where you can be like, oh, look at the look at the growth numbers. Well, the first 10,000 people on Facebook, I know because I was one of them, were doing the, basically the same things that the 10 millionth person on Facebook was doing. They were just like, you know, looking at each other's photos and posting on each other's walls or whatever. And now, but the first 10,000 blockchain people essentially had some sort of like acid trip epiphany type thing about the world, and the 10 millionth uh, blockchain user is probably not even gonna know that they're using a blockchain. So we're gonna have to cross this usefulness chasm, that's why it's awesome to be at a hackathon. Uh, yeah, and hopefully, you know, as we look at Ethereum in 2019, as we keep building and growing together, we'll see a very different Ethereum five years from now. So thank you everyone.